minutes. Okay, that was really tough. And you didn't even see half of what I did because charging up the balloons without the camera nearby because I was afraid it would discharge and the camera hurt my camera. And keeping that charge on the balloons, that was really tough. Uh, here's a secret. I own a dehumidifier and I dehumidified that back stock room for several hours before I did that. It's tough. It's a tough thing to do. And if you have trouble making this balloon activity work, you can try it. But if it doesn't work for you, just take my data. Uh, each balloon was three grams, 0.03 kilograms. The length of the string was one meter. Add that to the center, you know, the, basically the radius of the balloon, 1.2 meters, string to center. The distance between the balloons is 0.5. And so what you do is, because, is I'm making right triangles where L is the hypotenuse and half of D, 0.25, is the horizontal leg. So inverse sine of 0.25 over 1.2 gives me an angle of about 12 degrees. Okay, so I need to get all those things before I even start. So what do I ask my students to do? I ask them to do all these things. So I'm just going to go through them in order. Feel free to pause the video at any time if you want to get a good look because I'm just going to go through them quickly. First, they need to draw a free body diagram showing the forces on at least one of the balloons. And can I tell you right now, I make them draw a free body diagram for both. And they're identical, the free body diagrams. They're just mirror images of each other. And then I want them to write equations that relate the forces on the free body diagram. And the ultimate goal is solving for the charge on one balloon. We're again, assuming that both of the balloons have the same charge. So the electric force balances the opposite of the theta, the horizontal tension component. So the electric force, KQQ over distance squared, that's center to center distance for the balloons, is equal to tension sine theta. That's this component right here. And the weight force is equal to the tension cosine theta, as you can see right here. I don't know if it's coming out on the video. I can barely see it myself. But this dot is set against a grid. And so the students, anytime I make them draw a free body diagram, they have to. Um, I give them a dot, and it's set against a 5. Uh, really, I think it's a 10 by 10 grid. So in other words, the dot's in the center of the 10 by 10 grid. And the students use the grid to show that the component of tension, which here is two boxes, I can't, I don't know if you can see it, uh, is equal to the electric force, that's two boxes. The weight force is four boxes, so the tension has to go up four boxes. That's how I have the students show that those components and forces are equal. Okay, so what am I going to do? I'm going to solve for the charge on one balloon. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to divide the two left sides, KQ squared over MG and D squared, after that's divided, divide the two right sides, tension over tension cancels, sine over cosine is tangent. Okay, so now I'm going to get Q by itself, so the MG D squared comes up with the tan theta, the K goes down, we take the square root and I get 4.2 10 to the negative 7 coulombs. If you get an entire micro coulomb, if you get 10 to the negative 6 coulombs, you are a boss. You will not get that much charge on a balloon unless you're insane or or your Emperor Palpatine from Star Wars or something like that shooting lightning at it. And then how did the balloon not pop? You explain that one to me. Okay, uh, and this is actually pretty generous. I usually can't get over two 10 to the negative seven coulombs. Okay, then I asked the students to find the number of electrons that were added to the balloon. Well, that's simply taking the charge on the balloon and dividing by the charge of one electron. They get 2.6 10 to the 12th electrons. Now, Based on my research online, and you may want to uh, verify this, it turns out that in rubber materials, there's one electron for about every three times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. And that's based on the balance of protons and neutrons and typical rubber material, if that makes sense. I'm not even counting on mass of the electrons themselves. Um, so then I asked the students to find the total number of electrons that were in the balloon before it was even charged. So if you know the mass of the balloon and you know the a number of kilograms that each electron is part of, I don't know if that makes any sense to say that, then all you have to do is divide the mass of the balloon by the mass per one electron, and you get 10 to the 24th electrons. So we've got the total number of electrons in the balloon before it was charged, and the total number of electrons added to the balloon. Now to students, they see 2, 10 to the 12, and they see 1, 10 to the 24th. These numbers are so big, they don't really process it in scientific notation. I mean, that 12 and that 24 exponents, those are just numbers to them. So what I ask them to do is I ask them to actually write out in standard form the number of electrons added to the balloon, which was 2.6 trillion, and the number of electrons that were already in the balloon to begin with, which is 1 trillion trillion.
Okay, so why do I do this? Because I want students to know that when you charge an object statically, you're only adding a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction, two trillionths of the total number of charges that were already in the balloon to begin with. Holy smokes, it really doesn't take a lot of charge to make the static electricity effect show up. Okay, I want them to calculate the electric force, which you think they already, they kind of already did, but they can plug in and they can get the electric force. For me, the electric force between the balloons was 0.00635. You're just doing Coulomb's law. Then I ask them to calculate the gravitational force that one balloon exerts on the other. Warning, your kids are going to say mg. You need to make sure they pay attention to what you just said. I didn't say the gravitational force from the Earth. I said the gravitational force that one of those yellow balloons exerts on the other yellow balloon. And that's Let's call for a universal gravitational uh, equation here. G, the two masses squared, that was 0.003, three grams squared, over the distance between them, you get 2.4 times 10 to the negative 15 newtons. I really want students to walk away from this activity knowing that the gravitational force between two objects is always less than the electric force if those objects have any detectable amount of charge at all. So once again, I'm going to make them write it out. So here's the electric electric force 0.00635 and the gravitational force is 0.00000000024 newtons. That's how much stronger and this is important. I think it's very much worth it for your students to do. And if you don't do it with the balloon activity, have them do the electric repulsion and gravitational force between two protons. Maybe two protons that are 10 to the negative 15 meters apart. That's two protons and a helium atom. Anyway, so and then even even then, uh, the two protons in a helium nucleus, uh, 10 to the negative 15 apart, I think they exert like 200 newtons of force on each other electrostatically. And so that's a jumping off point to talk, talk about the strong force when you get there in the quantum unit. All right, what would the balloons have looked like if they were identical and had same sign but different amounts of charge? So this is an extension question. This is a good extension question. What if the charges, what these two balloons still repelled? and they still had the same mass, but different charges. A lot of students will incorrectly believe that one of the balloons will be at a different angle than the other because they have different charges. That is not the case. So what I do is I have the students uh, draw the two free body diagrams again, and they need to see that this Fe, K, little q for one balloon, big Q for the other balloon, little charge, big charge, KQQ over distance squared, and this one, K, big Q, little q over distance squared, that's the same force, even though they have different charges. Same mass, because I said same mass, so they better have the same angle of tension. However, what would the balloons have looked like if they had different masses? If the balloons had different masses, then their electric forces are still the same, because K, big, little charge over distance squared, doesn't matter. However, their mg forces would be different. Remember, these are not an action-reaction pair. The electric forces are. Left balloon forces right balloon, right balloon forces left balloon, but these mgs do not have to be the same. Earth pulls on light balloon. Earth pulls on heavy balloon, not an action-reaction pair. So, because these are not the same, the tensions have different values and angles. I feel like that's a really good discussion to have with your students. Okay. Students really struggle with electric field. Students really struggle with electric potential. They really, really, really struggle with the relationship between the two. So I think it's worth discussing the relationship between electric field and potential and to understand what electric field, electric potential actually do to charge objects and the relationship between the two. Okay, so my analogy for this, it's almost a parable and I'm gonna explain it to you and I hope you can see it up here. I want you to imagine, so this is me explaining electric field, electric potential. Imagine a world that's made up of just smooth glass. So the landscape is smooth glass, or it could be smooth metal. It just has to be smooth material of some kind. No rough, no jagged, no, no places where you can poke your eyes out. There's no sharp edges anywhere. But the glass or the metal or whatever you think of, it's not flat. There are smooth mountains and hills. They're smooth valleys or depressions, whatever you want to think of. And in this world of glass or whatever, I want you to imagine marbles. These marbles roll around. 
Now because the glass or the landscape is smooth, the marbles don't lose energy to friction as they roll. But because the landscape is not equal elevation, mountains, depressions, and valleys, these marbles feel forces as they roll. So, in this analogy, the marbles are like positive charges. What do positive charges do? They, all, they feel a force that directs them downhill toward a lower elevation, right? That's what, that's, what mar that's what happens to marbles. Marbles feel a force that send them downhill. Now, the elevation of any location is like the electric potential. So, the mountain is like a high potential because it has a high elevation. The valley is like a low uh, potential because it has a low elevation. Can you have negative potential? Just like you could have negative elevation. Ask the people out in Death Valley or the Dead Sea, you can have negative elevations. The, now, why is elevation like electric potential? Well, because electric potential gives charges potential energy. Charges get potential energy from an electric potential. But elevation gives masses potential energy, mg height, right? So elevation, mg height, gives marbles potential energy. Electric potential gives positive and negative, but positive charges potential energy. What about the slope? Well, the slope is what determines the force, right? If you have a marble on an incline, it feels a little force if the incline is not steep, but a very large force if the incline is steep. Well, what's the thing that gives us force? Well, if you're a marble, it's the slope you're on, but if you're a charge, it's electric field. Electric field is what gives you a force. So the slope of any location is like the electric field at a point in space. So, what I'm seeing here, and I hope you can see it too, gosh, I really hope this shows up in the video, is I have this landscape. I see a mountain here. I see this valley down here. I see another mountain here, and I see a sharp mountain right here. So, this is very steep right here. That's a very strong electric field. This region's kind of flat right here, so that's not very strong electric field. That may be no electric field. At the very top here, we have no electric field because we have no slope. And again, I'm imagining the top of this mountain is like a high electric potential. Got a high electric potential, got a low electric potential. High height, low height, high electric potential, low electric potential. Steep slope over here, that's a strong electric field. Not very steep slopes here, not very or no electric field at all. And what else? Electric field's a vector. Which direction does electric field point? always directly downhill. Where do marbles want to roll? They always want to roll straight downhill. Well, electric field always points directly downhill toward lower potential. The only place that this analogy breaks down is the fact that charges can be negative. And so I see this mountain peak, and I imagine that marbles set on the peak will roll off the peak. Just you, you can't really balance the marble on the peak. But I see this valley, and I can imagine a marble rolling back and forth in this valley, just kind of oscillating, right? What if the marbles were negative? What if they were negative marbles? Well, then the marble would not stay in the valley. It would speed up as it rolls uphill speed up as it rolls uphill but when it reached the top of a hill it could oscillate because it's trying to get to the top of the hill right it's the only place where the analogy breaks down we don't have actual negative marbles in our universe right sorry about that Okay, so marbles feel a force that causes them to roll downhill toward lower heights. In the same way, positive charges feel force that causes them to move toward a lower potential. And that means that electric field always points downhill toward lower potentials. All right, so what I'd like to do now is I'd like to show you some shapes that I use to explain electric potential to my students. So let me get those out now.